It is so good to see everyone here this morning. We're thankful that you have uh, been able to get back together. You know, it hasn't been since uh, the early 1900s, about 1918, that churches uh, were asked by the state to not have services. And so, you know, that's a, a century ago, but we're thankful that since we have been out, hopefully that uh, things have been contained and we'll, we're able to worship together again. This morning, our service will be a little bit different. What we're going to do is have a prayer and then a song, and then following that, we'll have Brother David, and then uh, we'll have our, wor- our, our uh, Lord's Supper after the sermon this morning. And so just stay tuned and follow suit, and we'll be ready to go. We'll make announcements, make some announcements at the end, but we want to go ahead and get started this morning, so I'm going to ask Mike Morton, if he will, to go ahead and be making his way up here so that we can have our opening prayer. Please bow with me. Holy Father, we're so thankful that we can be back in attendance today as a family, as your children, and that we can worship you that today in spirit and truth. And we're thankful, Father, for all the technology that you've helped men to develop where we could worship you while we've been safer at home. We pray, Father, that you will guide the scientists, research people, that they can come up with a treatment, a vaccine, or an antidote to this virus where we can get back to reasonable life and we can continue to get back to our services on Sunday, Sunday night, and Wednesday night where we can all assemble together. Father, we're thankful for our elders and their leadership. We pray that you will bless them, strengthen them, have a long life in your service. We're so thankful and we love them so dearly. We're thankful for Mark and Marlene and their dedication and the work that they do. We pray that you'll continue to be with them. Father, we pray that we're having an hour uh, meeting starting today with Brother Barker, that you will be with him, strengthen him, and have him also have a long life in your service. We pray that you will be with those who are sick of the congregation, those who are facing surgeries. We pray that you will be with Jennifer Wiggins as she uh, faces back surgery this coming Friday, that it will be a complete success. We pray for others, Father, who are battling cancer, for Tracy, and we pray for Cookie Hotch and other people, Father, that you will continue to be with them and strengthen them. Thank you for this day, and we pray that our worship will be according to your will and accept in your sight. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. All right, before we sing, let me go ahead and introduce David, and at the end of the song, he'll come up and have our uh, lesson for this morning. David, of course, grew up here in Jasper. He is uh, the son of Jimmy, and what's your mother's name? Judy. I almost forgot it there. And uh, many of you know them. Uh, His sister and mother both are members at the 6th Avenue Congregation. And so we're thankful that he is here with us today. David has preached at the Midway Congregation. And that's not a, I didn't misspeak. uh, Preached at Midway up in uh, uh, between Moulton and Decatur for a number of years. He's married to Kelly. They have two daughters, Kayla and Anna. And... uh, We're thankful that he is here with us today. David is one of our co-directors of Polishing the Pulpit, and so we've worked together through the years. We got to know each other when we were at Faulkner University, and hopefully you will get to know him at least a little bit this morning through his sermon and also through the rest of the week in uh, the video sermons that he will be presenting here for us. All right, our opening song this morning should have some significance to us. It's Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
Good morning to you. It's a beautiful day. I tell you what, driving down this morning, I thought you couldn't ask for a better day. And I'm ready for this hot weather. I'm ready for it. And i um, been looking forward to summer all year long. I'm not going to tell my joke this morning because I'm not sure what your reaction would be. So uh, take, a deep, take a deep breath. We're all okay. I'm very grateful to be here. And many of you um, are so precious to my family. And I truly believe that not only your family, your physical family, but as you are trying to serve the Lord, the Lord himself will bring people into your lives that helps you. Certainly a number of you are looked upon in that way for us personally, especially Mark and Marlene. And we don't know where we would be, my wife and I, we don't know where we would be if it had not been for the influence of Mark and Marlene. We're so grateful. You better not forget my mother's name. She's going to be, she's going to be listening to this today at some point. She may... So uh, I, I dread your situation if she runs into you and you forget her name. We are going to be focusing on the Lord's Supper, so let's get started together. We'll start with uh, four goals of the um, Lord's Supper and then uh, four ways to help meet these goals. And I think we'll be profited uh, from this. Four goals, goals and in the sense of my goal is to get through this lesson without making a mess of it. So four, four goals, and we're very familiar with the Lord's Supper, but it's good for us to review and to, and to let the truths of the Lord's Supper sink deep into our hearts and souls. We remember Jesus speaking of the Lord's Supper with his disciples in Matthew 26, and beginning in verse 26, we also remember that as the church is established on the day of Pentecost, that we read concerning those who obey the gospel to Acts 2.42, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. We know that we read in Paul's travels in Acts 20 and verse 7 that they stopped in Troas and on the first day of the week they came together with the brethren and, and broke bread and worshiped and, and praised God together. And we especially know, and if you want to have your Bibles open, to 1 Corinthians 11, we know that there, there's an extensive discussion of the Lord's Supper and Paul's remarks about that, and we'll, we'll draw some of our points uh, from 1 Corinthians 11. And so let's get started. Four goals, four goals in regard to partaking of the Lord's Supper. First goal uh, is this, to listen carefully to God, to listen carefully to God and obey Him. That is the essence of worship. And it is also the essence and the main idea behind the Lord's Supper. To listen to God carefully and to obey Him uh, in worship. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and along about verse uh, 23. He says, For I received uh, from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Paul is letting them know that what he is saying here is coming from the Lord, from the Lord himself. You can compare also 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, where Paul says there, I delivered unto you that which also I received. I delivered unto you that which also I received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And so Paul is saying, what I received, that's exactly what I have delivered unto you. Paul is letting these brethren know that this is coming directly from the Lord. You might also compare Galatians 1, 11, and 12, where Paul says, brethren, the gospel that I preached unto you did not come from man. I, I didn't associate with man for it. I, did, I wasn't taught it, you know. Uh, I, it came from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus revealed his will to Paul. Paul revealed it to the brethren. And now we're so grateful to have it uh, with us. The importance of this is to remember that God has spoken and that God is the boss. 
God is in charge. All authority is in Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, 18. He has the authority. He speaks, his authority is more important than any elected official. His, his authority is more important than any religious person. His, his authority is more important than any family member. We listen to God and we obey him. And that leads us into acceptable worship uh, before him. And so God has spoken. God has spoken about the Lord's Supper, the day upon which it's to be taken on the first day of the week, the emblems that are to be used, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, the meaning behind those things, where it's to be taken in the, in the uh, assembly of the church. And you know all this, but God has spoken about this, and we get in trouble. Mankind gets in trouble when we deviate whatsoever from what God has, has put down. Abel listened carefully uh, in Genesis 4. When, when he brought his worship from the flock uh, to the Lord, he listened carefully. How do we know he listened carefully? Well, Hebrews 11 verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the word of Christ. And so we know that Abel listened carefully in his worship. By faith, Abel offered unto God. That's the difference between Abel's worship and Cain's worship is that Abel listened more carefully and obeyed the Lord in the worship. We get in trouble when we deviate. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, In vain do you worship me, teaching as your commandments the doctrines of men. So that's goal number one. Goal number one, of course, is to listen carefully and obey him. Goal number two is to create and maintain a sharp focus, to create and maintain a sharp focus um, as we worship. Sharp uh, focus. The floating mind is the enemy of the Lord's Supper. The floating mind is the enemy of worship. And we all understand what we mean by that. I, I was very good at it. I'm still, I still have to struggle with it from time to time. Uh, but when I was a boy and I was coming up at, in, in the church over at Curry Church of Christ, you know, uh, I, my parents had me there in the pew every time, but they couldn't control my mind. Uh, sometimes my mind was on, I was replaying a baseball situation or I was creating a scenario that was going to happen at home uh, that afternoon in this beautiful uh, weather. And so the floating mind, though, is a danger even to adults. We know this. And so we have to maintain a sharp focus. Going back to Matthew 15, verse 7, Jesus said, uh, Many people draw near to the Lord uh, with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's the warning the Lord sends out uh, to us. Notice in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27, uh, Paul says, Whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup in an unworthy manner uh, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, that's, that's a pretty serious indictment, but it is just that serious. Uh, we, are, we are standing on sacred ground, spiritually speaking. This is holy ground. Whenever the Lord has something for us to do and to carry out, that's sacred to us. And um, we are to come with a great deal of humility and respect uh, toward Him as we, as we offer our worship uh, to Him. And so it is very serious, and it's sacred ground. And yes, it can put our soul uh, in jeopardy. If, um, and someone must say, well, you mean that I can be at the right place, and I can be uh, doing the right thing, and still uh, have my soul in jeopardy? Yes, because our heart has to be with the Lord. It has to be with the Lord. Now, a little side note there, I always say, uh, I we don't, when we say that, we don't want to put extra, any extra burden or guilt on, on young mothers because young mothers are, are, are wonderful, are wonderful. And so, you know, if you, the children need to be in worship and young moms need to go through all the struggles it takes to keep their children in worship and, and, a, and a young mother and young parents even, sometimes it's, it's not possible to, to have that sharp focus that you want to have, but the Lord just says, you know, do your best, do your best, okay? But nonetheless, we know that the sharp focus uh, needs to be there. There are many different ways to keep the sharp focus during uh, worship, during the Lord's Supper. We can have our Bibles open to 
particular passages that brings us, takes us back to uh, the cross and to those things that are so precious uh, to us. We can, we can read the words of the song that has, that has been led uh, just prior to uh, the Lord's Supper. We can, there's a lot of things you can remember. Uh, one thing that we often emphasize is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you think about the cross with those numbers. Uh, there's one Lord on the cross, and of course, uh, two thieves, and there were three crosses. Jesus' garments were uh, departed in four different ways, four parts to his garments. Five main wounds of Jesus. Of course, Jesus' whole body was really mangled by the time he got to the cross, so his whole body really looked like one big ugly wound. But we remember five major wounds on the, on the two hands and the two feet and the piercing of his side, five wounds. Six hours on the cross, six hours from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours on the cross. And then, of course, Jesus said seven things as he hung on the cross, seven sayings from the cross, such as, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, today you shall be with me in paradise. Behold your mother, behold uh, your son, those type, you know, Father, I thirst, you know, I thirst, uh, it is finished, seven sayings. So whatever it takes for you to do or doing in just a variety of take things, we all need to have a sharp focus in worship. That's goal number two. Goal number three is to be able to walk away with a fresh commitment, to be able to walk away with a fresh commitment, a rededication of both heart and life. To be able to walk away with a fresh commitment. That's what worship's about. That's what the Lord's Supper's about. And we have everything in the Lord's Supper to do just that. To have that, to renew ourselves in the Lord. Uh, we're going back uh, to that night in which, upon which Jesus was betrayed. And all that ugly scene, all the sacrifice. Uh, we, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 11 of the, of the body of Jesus of the blood of Jesus, of the death of Jesus, of the betrayal of Jesus. Uh, we take this on the Lord's day, so we're reminded of the resurrection of Jesus. All that took place at that particular time in, in, the, in those early ancient days is plenty to cause us to reflect upon ourselves and to really leave it with a renewed sense of commitment and dedication uh, to the Lord. You know, Paul says right there in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, 28, let a man examine himself and so let him take of the, of the cup and, and take of the fruit of the vine and, and eat of the bread and take of the cup. Uh, we're, we're to leave with a fresh sense of, of um, joy in, in the Lord. One of my favorite passages is right there in 2 Corinthians 5, 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. That's my favorite verse today. You know, it says, Jesus died for all, that all, who, all we who live uh, should not live unto themselves, but live to him, live for him, live for him who, uh, who died and, and rose again, who for our sakes died and rose again. So that's what this is about. That's why Jesus died, so that we can live, yes, come out of our sin, but also we don't just live, we don't live for ourselves, but we live for him. Which him? The, the, the one who for our sakes died and, and rose again. And similar to what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 24, when he talks about Jesus, his own self, uh, he bore our sins uh, in his body on that tree, that we haven't died to sin. See, that's one thing the cross should remind us of every day. The Lord's Supper ought to remind us of this all the time. We died to sin that we might live in the righteousness by whose stripes uh, we are healed. And so we ought to leave worship uh, wherever we're worshiping, whenever we worship, um, especially as we partake of the communion on the first day of the week. Uh, we ought to come out of that with a, a huge sense of joy, anxious to run into the world and tell uh, the world about the Lord. So goal number three is this fresh commitment. And goal number four is to draw a line between the Lord and the, and the world. To draw a line once again. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. 
it helps us once again to realize that the Lord and the world never go in the same direction. Okay. And notice there in, in 1 Corinthians 10 now, chapter 10, verse 16, Paul asks the question, the, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion of the blood of the Lord? The, the bread that we break, is it not a communion of the body of the Lord? Okay. Well, what's Paul saying? He's simply saying something we already know down deep, and that is whatever we serve or worship, we become one with the object of our worship. Okay. We become one with the one that we're worshiping. We, we, become, we, are, we're, we become fully devoted to that object of worship or, or to him whom, whom we worship. We become, we, we're fellowship and we're communion uh, with him. Okay. And that communion is not a, a, once, a one-time thing we do on, on Sunday, but rather it is that communion, that ideal, is to last throughout the week and throughout our lives, uh, really. So we're drawing a line there. We're drawing a line there. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. He will, he will hate the one and love the other and vice versa. Okay. And Paul brings that same idea out here in 1 Corinthians 10, 22. You cannot, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. Okay. You, you can't, many try to do this and many deceive themselves thinking that they're doing this, that, they're, that they are, they're paying reverence to God, but they're also serving the world. You can't do that. And, and the Lord's Supper reminds us of that every time we take it, it ought to, ought to. Jeremiah was facing the same temptations uh, his people were. Jeremiah chapter 7, 9 through 11, this is way back under the old law where they meet together in the house of the Lord. But nonetheless, here's his question. He says, will you, will you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and worship other gods and then come into this house, which is called by my name, and offer worship to me here. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. They thought that, that an hour of worship would cover a week of sin, and Jeremiah was letting them know that's just not the way it is. That's not acceptable to God. And so when we partake of the Lord's Supper, our fourth goal is to, to draw once again that start line between the Lord and the world. Let's move on now to a second part of our... our um, our thoughts on the Lord's Supper, and that is, uh, what are some ways in which uh, we can help accomplish these goals? Okay, what, well, it's really the Lord helping us. See, the Lord knows us better than anybody, absolutely. And we don't have to go through a number of passages. You know this. He knows us way down deep. He, he, I think Psalm 139 says he knows, he knows our, our, our words before, before they become. Our, he knows our thoughts way off. He knows our thoughts well before they come thoughts, become thoughts. He just knows us. The Lord knows that we are a forgetful people. The Lord knows that we are a distracted people. The Lord knows that we're fearful people. And so he has embedded within the Lord's Supper several components that helps us remember, that helps us focus, that helps us gain courage. Notice four of these components uh, with me. And then we'll draw our thoughts to a conclusion here. Component number one. Uh, there, is, there is a memorial component. A memorial component. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. It's a memorial. There's a memorial component about all of this. This do in remembrance of me. Paul takes us back to the night upon which Jesus is betrayed. Something huge happened. Something life-changing, world-changing happened there with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and, and then later the establishment of the church. And, and we go back and remember that. It's a memorial component. You know, God put a, Genesis 9, 13, God put a rainbow in the cloud as a reminder of the covenant that he was making between him and Noah and him and the whole population. That is, he would never destroy the world again with a flood. Okay. And God keeps his, his word. And we are accustomed to memorials. We, we, um, you know, we create a grave site where we can remember our loved ones. We create um, you know, photograph albums 
and other things that bring the, the good things and the good memories of our loved ones uh, back to us. And we're accustomed to that. God knows us in that way. And so there's a memorial component to it. Okay. And then also, um, there's a visual component. Number two, there's a visual component to it. Jesus often used things that you could, you could touch and feel, tangible things, to remind us of those things which are spiritual. Okay. To, he used visible things to remind us of the invisible, most important things in life. There's a, and so the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine is something that we touch and we partake of every time. And it reminds us of those things that we weren't there involved in, but nonetheless, they're, they're very, very true. And it reminds us of the invisible God uh, as well. Jesus one time called a child in the midst of he and his disciples to teach them about humility, Matthew 18 and 1 through 4. Jesus would look, uh, as he was talking, um, teaching about worry, he would say, uh, well, look to the birds of the air. Uh, they, ne never, they never put seed in the ground. They don't sow. They don't gather in the barns. But your heavenly Father takes care of them. And he said, well, look at the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor do they spin. But I say in you that Solomon and all of his riches and beauty was never arrayed like one of these. Okay. And Jesus would use visible things to teach us those things which are most important for our faith. And so the Lord's Supper is something that's tangible and visible, but it reminds us of the things which are most important. You know, in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18, Paul says, We look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen, those are eternal. And the Lord's Supper takes us back to those eternal things. There's a visual component to it. I love to talk about this, uh, the visible to the invisible. And maybe uh, you can do an elaborate study on that uh, yourself, but it's, it's just tremendous. You think about the world in which we live is visible, but it reminds us of the power of God's creation, invisible, right? So we can go on and on about that. A, a third thing that helps us is there's a social component. The third component here that helps us accomplish these goals is a social component. Notice in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, Paul says, we partake of one bread, because we are one body. And it helps us, or it helps me, it should encourage us that as we partake of the supper, our brothers and sisters in Christ are also taken of the supper. But also that brother, brothers and sisters worldwide on this first day of the week are doing the very same thing. It's a powerful show of love to the Lord. That's the way he created it. There's a social component uh, to the Lord's Supper. And not only social in the sense of, of encouragement, but social in the sense of, of a bond. The, if the Lord's Supper cannot remind us that we must be bound together in Christ, then nothing can. There, we partake of one bread because we are one body. Nothing calls people back together like the death of Jesus and his crucifixion. Nothing brings a group back together like the Lord's Supper. There's a social component uh, to it. Any problem in the world, any problem in the world, any problem in the church can be solved by looking at the cross. No doubt about it. And then fourthly, there's a spiritual component. A spiritual component. Jesus promises in Matthew 26 and 29 that um, he's going to be with us and we're in his kingdom. He said, I'll be with you as you drink it new in the kingdom of, of God. Uh, he's with us. It is very good to do. To get you some sort of picture of Jesus and try to think about him sitting right here with us as we partake of the communion, because in a very, very, very real sense, He is. There's no limitations to God. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. The Lord is with us. There's a spiritual component to it. Okay. His presence makes all the difference. You guys never did this, but we did it. Okay. Mom and Dad's bed 
was the best trampoline in the neighborhood. Okay. And we would use it like that, but when mom walked in, something changed. The nature of that bed completely changed. Once mom's presence was, was, was known to be anywhere close, then all of a sudden the bed was no longer a trampoline. Okay. Well, the Lord's presence is to make a huge difference, and it does as we worship him in spirit and in truth. The spiritual component. And you know, back in the old time, uh, for example, when Joshua, they were getting ready to go into the land, uh, they crossed the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant. And God cut off those waters so they could walk across on dry, dry ground. And then the Lord had Joshua set up stones as a memorial. Okay. And the reason was, you look in Joshua 4, verse 6, the reason was God knew that the, their children would ask, what's the purpose of these stones? And in that way, they'd be ready to answer them what God had done for them. Same thing if you look at the Passover feast, Exodus 12, 24 to 27, God said the same thing almost as, as he's telling them about the unleavened bread and partaking of that for seven days and the, and, the, and the slaying of the lamb without spot and without blemish. He said, your children will ask you. When your children ask you, you can tell them, hey, by great power, God brought us out of our bondage in Egypt and now we are the people that we are. So it is. With these emblems, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, we want our children to ask us about this. It is God's visual aid to help us talk about Christ and talk about the most important things in life. We want our neighbors to ask us. We, we want the world to ask us. We need to bring that up, by the way. When, during the week, you know, you go into the gas station and you're just talking for a moment, you know, and say, yeah, we had a great worship yesterday, you know, we always take the communion. Somebody's going to eventually ask you, y'all take communion all the time? You take every first day of the week? And man, when they do that, it's like sick and bulldog. You said, yes, by the way, you want, you want me to sit down and talk to you about that? It, we, got, we can do this. Can we not take the, the unleavened bread that represents the body of Jesus? Can we not do this? And go from there and show that Jesus died for us that God is so holy that we could not have a relationship with him except that Jesus died for us? And can't we show them that the blood cleanses us and how to get in contact with that blood through the waters of baptism? We can do this. We, we, we can do this. We want people to ask us about this. I don't know, four or five years ago, the brother of one of our members was, was dying of cancer. And the brother of one of our members, he, he had grown up in a denominational church, and really, um, but they wanted me to go talk to, to the man who's in his last days. So I went, I had several meetings with him. I never was able to baptize him. But we got a long way into our studies, and I, and I ended up preaching the man's funeral and I, and, I, and I shared this at the funeral. But the man was very frustrated. And, and when we were in, in his living room and we were going over the Lord's Supper and how meaningful it is and how you take it on the first day of the week, he stopped me. He said, explain to me that first day of the week. And I just explained, you know, I showed him the passages. He got very frustrated. He called up his denominational preacher got him on the phone while I'm sitting there and said, why haven't we been taking the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? He was frustrated. And then they asked me to do the funeral. I said, absolutely. And I said, I know, I know exactly what I'm going to talk about. I talked about the Lord's Supper at that funeral and how, how meaningful that, it, that is and how the, the man who had passed had brought that up. Nonetheless, you understand what I'm saying. There are four goals here and definitely... Four components that can help us to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we've got to have it in our hearts as we do it. Marlene here, she, very artistic, very artistic mind. There are artistic minds and then there are people who do not have an artistic mind. 
So a person, there's a painting, a beautiful painting, pretty expensive painting, and it's hanging on the wall. A person that does not have an artistic mind may look at that and say, wow, that's a lot of money. And then he looks at it, he, he looks at, he's looking at the frame, he's looking at the canvas, he's looking at the paint, and he kind of says to himself, he said, for that amount of money, I could paint my house and my fence. But the person with an artistic mind looks at that and sees the beauty and the delight in that painting, the amount of energy and work it took to create that painting, and has a full appreciation for that artistic work. That's what we're after with the Lord's Supper, is a full appreciation, not just the emblems, but everything that, that those emblems stand for. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you this morning in worship, and I look forward to being able to worship with you here around the Lord's table here in just a few minutes. But if there is a spiritual need that anyone has uh, this morning, maybe you're ready to be renewed in the Lord. Maybe it is that you're ready to um, respond in love to the love that the Lord has brought to us by submitting to Him through your faith and baptism. Can we help you in any way? Please uh, make that known right now uh, as we, we... Are we singing? David did an excellent job with talking about the Lord's Supper this morning. I'm very grateful for that. You know, today is also the first day of the week, and it's also something that we've been all looking forward to as far as coming together again here at Midway. And we're very happy for that. As we look at Luke chapter 22, where Christ implemented the Lord's Supper, and down in verse 14, We'll read, And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on this table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. Let's pray. 
Our Father and our God, we truly thank you for your Son. Father, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We pray, Father, that we would focus solely on this sacrifice that was made for us. We thank you for this bread which to us as Christians represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he hung on that cross. May we partake of it in a manner that is pleasing unto you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. My apologies for not mentioning before, if you did not pick up a communion cup, we can have one delivered to your seat. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we truly thank you for the sacrifice. Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf. We pray that you would bless this fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. going to go ahead and offer the thanks for the contribution. You probably noticed as we came in that there are contribution baskets that are at the doors where you go in and out. So you can, a lot of, several of you have already left us, uh, the money's there. So if not, then uh, you can do so as we exit the building and uh, as we have closing remarks, Mark will direct us in how we are to exit. So. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the day. We thank you for the many blessings that you provide. Father, we thank you for our health, for our jobs that we're able to work and support our families. We pray, Father, that you bless the portions which are returned back to thee for continuing the work and the, uh, spreading the borders of your kingdom here. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, we are so grateful to be able to be back together today, and it's great to be able to see all of you here. We appreciate so much the fact that you have chosen to be with us today, and we look forward in the days ahead to getting back to normal and having our service back to normal, but uh, until that time, we'll continue to have an abbreviated service as we have this morning. Our dismissal will be by, I think, Tommy, uh, I forgot who they said is going to be. Yeah, Tommy Johnson, uh, he'll be uh, dismissing us with a prayer. As we exit today, the elders have asked that we sort of do it like a funeral, uh, not, not with a long face, but uh, we'll begin at the back, and we'll have one of our elders back there, and we'll dismiss by, by pew, by row. And so that way, uh, you'll know when, when to go. And we ask that you don't linger in the foyer, go on outside into the parking lot and talk as long as you want to, but uh, we want you to go ahead and exit out of the building. Uh, two or three announcements that we do need to make. Mike mentioned in his prayer this morning, Jennifer Wiggins, she'll be having back surgery this coming Friday, and so please keep her in your prayers. This was on the announcement screen, as you read this morning, hopefully. But Tarina Gant, who is the daughter of Becky Odom, had emergency gallbladder surgery this past Thursday, I think it was. And uh, she is now at home, and Becky said yesterday she is doing much better. And so keep those in your prayers. There were others that we had listed, but we hope that you looked at those. And if you did not uh, get the link for the bulletin this morning, uh, if you will let us know, if you'll send me a text, I'll make sure that you get that 
that link. And uh, uh, we don't have paper bulletins today, but we'll get that to you. Always uh, look forward to seeing you. Uh, we won't have Wednesday night services or night services. Remember that you should be looking for a link each night, tonight through Wednesday night, for the lessons that, uh, that Brother David will be presenting in our virtual gospel meeting. Are there other announcements that we need to make before we dismiss? Again, we're thankful that you're here, and please remember to wait until uh, someone comes to your pew to direct you out. Uh, Brother Tommy. Father, thank you for this hour that you have blessed us with. We're grateful, Father, that we've been able to come back together again. Not in entirety, Father, as a body at Midway as a whole, but in two different services. We're grateful, Father, for this privilege. We're grateful, Father, that we can reassemble and we have looked forward to this. And we're grateful to you, Father, and thank you for it. We know, Father, your word assures us that where two or three are gathered together, that you are there, your son is there in the midst as well. And we're grateful, Father, to know that even though for the past two and a half months that we have worshipped you privately in our homes, that your son is there with us. And we know he's with us here this morning. Thank you, Father, for everything that you do for us. Thank you, Father, for everything that you bless us with and bestow upon us. Help us always, Father, to be grateful for our blessings. For we know, Father, that sometimes we can lose them. Thank you, Father, for your Son, for sending him down to this world to live the perfect life that he lived and to finally go to a cross and hang there in our behalf and on our behalf. We're grateful, Father, for him and for that. Help us, Father, to always stay focused on him and on the cross. Bless this nation, Father, as we're going through difficult times. Bless the leadership to help us get through these difficult times. And help us, Father, as your children, to always set the right example to each and every one that we come in contact with. For it's through your Son we pray. Amen.